I need to acknowledge the work of our entire group uh, that we have at Colorado State as well as our collaborators um, at other institutions, in particular Keith Belk, who's my partner in leading our group. I also want to acknowledge our funders uh, for sponsoring the research, some of which I'll be talking about today. I'm sure you're all aware of the global importance of antimicrobial resistance and the huge public concern and public health concerns about antimicrobial exposures in all, uh, all its aspects. And probably nowhere is that more uh, concentrated than antimicrobial exposures that are part of food production. Uh, many people see that as an unexcusable use of antimicrobials, a waste of a resource that we can't have. As we look at it in our work, um, we're trying to help us meet uh, the global grand challenge of feeding an addition, you know, our population plus an additional three, three billion people by 2050. It's been estimated by uh, experts uh, that we'll probably have to double food production delivered globally. And of course, food production is not distributed evenly across the world. And so some of those areas that don't ha that'll have grow the most don't actually have the best infrastructures or the most amenable uh, climates for producing food. Um, other people would say that we should adopt a vegetarian diet and get away from these uh, aspects and so that we wouldn't have to worry about antimicrobial exposures in animals. Um, it's also pretty clear that as we change uh, population um, socioeconomic status that eating of red meat or eating of meat uh, is, is preferred in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of societies, even in societies that traditionally have not had that as part of their culture. So as we look, for example, at the socioeconomic growth in China uh, and other parts of Asia, uh, eating of beef has dramatically increased in those populations because people like beef, right? Um, other people would like to say that we should just reduce, so we can eat beef, but we should just not, we should just have production systems that don't have antimicrobial drug use. Well, that's very complicated. That's as complicated as food production systems are, and, and we, there are clearly welfare aspects of treating sick animals. As a veterinarian, I take that very seriously. Um, in addition, there are efficiencies for different types of production, and it's not as easy to produce as much food completely in the absence of the use of antimicrobial drugs. Additionally, we have to concern ourselves with the idea that this is an ecology, right? We've too often looked at uh, individual organisms or individual pathogens in, an, in, you know, just as a separate thing and not really consider the ecology of the production systems. And, and that's where our work lies, is that it's, all of this is extremely complicated and, and we, there are a lot of assumptions that have been made and conclusions that have been made that all antimicrobial uses are bad, particularly those in the production of food, and we should get away from them. But when you look at actually what the proofs are about which uses are most concerning and how that really affects people, the data is not exactly that solid, right? So we want to, we want to be data-based and we want, to, we want to promote production of efficient food, uh, promote efficient food production and we want to do it well. Um, I added this clip in here just at the last minute. Um, this was, uh, you maybe saw this in the news yesterday about this. Uh, uh, this group that has graded uh, fast food organization, fast food companies uh, about uh, the safety of their, of their meat. They actually say the safety of their meat. And really their grading is based on whether and how strongly they have, these companies have taken a stance about use of meat from raised without antibiotic systems, right? It has nothing to do with actual food safety, has nothing to do with whether or not there's antibiotics in food. And so there's a lot of fear mongering out there and a lot of misconceptions. There, 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 are no, there are no antibiotics in our meat, you know, in, com in countries like the United States because of controls that are put in place by uh, uh, production industries as well as USDA, FDA oversight about these kinds of things. And yet, a lot of people think because of the way we talk about meat, antibiotic-free chicken, for example, that, that if it's not antibiotic-free chicken, that there's antibiotics in your chicken. Okay, so we have to, we have to clarify these kinds of things. When we talk about the risks related to antimicrobial resistance in people from uses in animals, there is, a, there is this anthropogenic hypothesis that has to be met in order for there to be risk in people. So in order for this to be true, we have to have antimicrobial use in animals that has to lead to promotion of antimicrobial resistance uh, in those animals, um, enteric uh, in particular, enteric organisms, um, and that these organisms must then go on to be part of the food and it must colonize the individuals who consume that food, and then you must have adverse health effects in the people that eat this, 
right? So that's, that all has to be true if our use in animals actually causes public health risk in people. Now, we can isolate organisms from people and from food that are, that are resistant, salmonella, campylobacter, you know, et cetera. We can isolate resistant bacteria, and we can find antimicrobial use in animals, but that doesn't tie the chain as to whether or not there's a causal link in all of that. And yet many people assume that. When we've gone after this to try and study it, um, uh, governmental agencies, uh, uh, academic researchers, other groups have typically looked at fecal samples and they've cultured that for E. coli and then characterized the resistance using in vitro methods that are similar to what you know, have been used for 100 years. They harken back to Coke and Pasteur. Okay? Now, as I've worked in this over 20 years in, in antimicrobial resistance work, I've become increasingly skeptical and disheartened with these kinds of ideas, even though I've sold that idea to governmental funding agencies, right? Okay. Um, um, so, I mean, think about this for a second. So I work a lot in cattle, and in, in cattle feedlots, there can be tens of thousands, maybe even 100,000 cattle in a feedlot, and those cattle are grouped into pens, 100, 200, 300, okay? Each of those cattle produce something like 30, 30 kilograms of wet weight feces in a day, all right? And each of those grams in, the, in that fecal matter contain 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 bacteria of a variety of species, maybe more than 1,000 bacterial species in an individual fecal sample. This is a, a dendrogram representation of the diversity and abundance of different fecal species, and yet we look at E. coli. Now, I've actually blown up that black that black pie piece, because you can't see it if I actually have it up there and just point at it. And we look at E. coli and talk about it representing all of the ecology of the, of the fecal organisms that are there. Now, how we study that, of course, now take those realities and how we study that is we go into a pen of cattle and we uh, walk a systematic pattern and collect one gram of feces from 20 different fecal pats. We stir that up with a stick. We stick a Q-tip into that fecal matter and we plate that on a, on a blood auger plate. We pick one organism, right? Maybe we pick two, okay? Maybe we pick five colonies. We're really going out there, okay? Um, okay? And then we take those isolates, you know, five isolates, two isolates, and then we characterize them in in vitro methods across maybe, you know, this is, this is representation of maybe 20 antimicrobial drugs, right? And we look at that and we say, there is more resistance, there's not as much resistance, and then we, we, hypo we, we project that out, right, that that's a risk ecologically. All right. So to me, that's a hugely fallacious way to research this and, and draw valid conclusions that we're trying to draw about this complex ecology. So we study things that are easy to culture, like Enterococcus and non-type specific E. coli, not disease-causing E. coli, non-type specific E. coli, we look at resistance and we talk about it as if it rep represents everything, pathogens, non-pathogens, environment, non-environment, et cetera. And, and there, are pro there are inherent problems with the way that we've done that. And I'll, I'll highlight that with a few slides here. So this is a study that we did, a, pr a prospective study over four years uh, in, in feedlot cattle. Um, uh, tens of thousands of cattle were sampled, you know, representing hundreds of thousands of animals that were in the same pens. Um, uh, these are E. coli isolates, and, and we've got antimicrobial drugs across the bottom, different antimicrobial drugs, and the percent resistance in those isolates. And then the bars represent different time points across there. Okay? So in this study, we found a weak association with increased resistance with tetracycline use in the cattle. Okay? Um, and we found an uh, increase in resistance prevalence over time. That fits the hypothesis that our use in animals is causing a problem. It's increasing resistance, right? The longer they're in the feedlot, the more that they, the population's exposed, the more resistance we see, right? And it's associated with resistance. Okay, we'll buy that, okay? This study, okay, we actually looked at a feedlot where they took the sick cattle, the ones that are actually treated parenterally with therapeutic doses of antimicrobial drugs, put them in separate hospital pens, and we looked at feces from those cattle. Now, the purple bars are those cattle, the prevalence in those. The other bars are fecal samples taken at different times in the, in the feeding period, front being early, back being late, okay? So first thing, um, there's more resistance in these uh, treated cattle. Fits our hypothesis, right? But when we look over time in the, in the pens, we actually see across all the antimicrobial drugs, we see a decrease in the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance over time. Hmm. That's not exactly what I told you just a minute ago, right? 
Then there are studies like this, which we did uh, looking at raised without antibiotic cattle or natural cattle and conventional cattle, and these are all lumped together. But, um, and again, these are classified from early feeding period to late feeding period, and it's pretty clear to see in tetracycline this increasing prevalence of antimicrobial resistance. Now, half of these cattle, there was no antibiotics at all in their exposure, and there was no tetracycline use in any of the cattle in, at all, period, in the feedlot, not, not part of any, any regimen at all, okay? So why do we see increasing resistance over time? This doesn't fit together, right? And so, uh, to me, it kind of shows, it, it brings up questions of we're not, we're not dissecting the question properly, we're not studying it properly. And I think it shows, these, are, these show evidence that we have to consider more broadly the ecology and the impacts of antimicrobial resistance. We can't, I don't think we can look at it like this and actually draw conclusions. So it, it has led us to start using metagenomic approach where we can look at the entire ecology as opposed to this very artificial pulling out of isolates. Okay. Um, just, a, just a throw out to say that I'm going to talk about the metagenome here throughout this, stu this, stu this talk, and I fully recognize that what we really need to be looking at is functionally what is being produced, okay? and that's an absence in our work. And it's really hard in metagenomic work, especially shotgun metagenomic work, to to look at some of these kinds of things, but, but I'll, I'll fully admit that we're not exactly looking at that the way we should. I'll also make a shout out to the methods. Now, I'm not gonna go through our, our metagenomic uh, approach, uh, either from a laboratory side or from a bioinformatics side, but I will tell you that um, I can completely change the results of our study just based upon the database that we use for our alignment, right? Uh, right? Uh, so we can completely change the results based upon the methods we use bioinformatically, and we completely change the results whether we, you know, with the type of approaches we use for sample handling, for sample storage, right, as was mentioned earlier across these kinds of things. And so the caveat emptor of metagenomic work is the devil's in the details, and we're not standardizing nor are we discussing the limitations and strengths of the different approaches, and we really have to do that as we go forward. Now, the metagenomic approach has great advantages, as you all know. It, when we extrapolate that out to agriculture and what we can do with that, just think not only if we're talking about resistance, but we can now talk about the efficiency of animal production, the efficiency of food production, and we can potentially um, prevent disease without the use of antibiotics. We can change starch metabolism, which is a huge factor in all kinds of animals and food production. Um, we can change fiber metabolism, uh, uh, enhancing that so that people can get, or animals can get more nutrition, more nutrition value out of every mouthful that they take, okay? All right, so switch now for a minute and talk, uh, expand on that and talk about antimicrobial use and antimicrobial exposures on the resistance genes or the resistome component of the metagenome, right? Um, there is very interesting work uh, that kind of hints at it, antimicrobial use in humans can have varying effects besides the therapeutic ones that we're looking at. So you've probably seen some of the uh, press about a, a few studies that show that uh, beta-lactam use or penicillin-like or cephalosporin-like drug exposures in children, a single exposure even, can lead to associations with increased childhood obesity risk. Now that's pretty, that's pretty interesting to think that a, you could disrupt the microbiome and change it such that you could lead to uh, an obesity-associated microbiome or an obesity-associated phenotype with a single exposure to antimicrobial drugs. And even some evidence that uh, maternal exposures uh, in the prenatal period may have the same impact. And probably, if that's true, probably from the transfer of the microbiome from the mother to the, to the, uh, to the fetus or to the uh, infant. Um, you're all aware of secondary dysbiosis effects such as uh, Clostridium difficile associated with antimicrobial drugs. A single uh, exposure to cephalosporin changes in colonized pa patients that are colonized with C. difficile. Uh, it will uh, increase shedding log fold uh, in those individuals. Many of those will rebound and they will stop shedding, but it can lead to this uh, long-term dysbiosis, which you're all aware of. Um, there's also uh, thoughts about this can change immune function, um, somewhat related to the, the hygiene hypothesis for allergies, et cetera, right? So there's a variety of effects that have been suggested. I don't think completely studied or completely proven in, in almost any of these. How, how does this, um, how does this uh, uh, commensal uh, microflora impact uh, the, the interaction with pathogens, okay? 
Um, this has been talked about a little bit, uh, just to mention that some of the mechanisms where uh, the, the natural microbiome or the commensal microbiome may fight off the disease effects of pathogens might, through, might be through competition for nutrients, uh, competition for adhesion sites, antagonism of the different bacteria, as well as anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. Now, when we talk about livestock, of course, then this, this again, is a, is a very important aspect of our studies of the microbiome, where we're trying to reduce antimicrobial exposures, right, uh, where, we, where they're being used for disease prevention and for, uh, for disease treatment. Another aspect of the microbiome which is important to uh, cattle, which I, I alluded to earlier, of course, is through the digestion and the, and the, uh, the microbiome of the gut. Um, we're now trying to get into studies of the core microbiome uh, of, of livestock, of, of food-producing animals, just as we are in other species, such as humans. And um, the, the ruminant is a fascinating animal, right, or fascinating animals. Cattle, um, that, that pre-gastric fermentation vat is what allows them to digest the lignans and starches, which are indigestible to people, right, complex starch, complex carbohydrates, and allows us to turn that into nutritious food. But we, it also can have, uh, it can be dramatically impacted by the other dietary components, just like it can in people. If you give too much starch, right, in an acute fashion to cattle, they, uh, it disrupts the microbiome. Uh, you get an overproduction of, of uh, acid-producing bacteria, and, and it affects, and it can kill the cattle, right? So what this is showing in this diagram here uh, is that you have this core microbiome, right, uh, and then... If we have cattle that are on a high forage diet, there are other predominant species as opposed to those that are on a high grain diet. But if we if they give them an acute overdose of, of starch, then we lead then we can have a migration of the microbiome, right? But it will stabilize back to this uh, to this core microbiome picture, right? So there is acute plasticity, acute changeability of the microbiome, but there is also resiliency in that the microbiome wants to go back, it appears, to its natural state or its established state. But that's very different depending on the species of animals that we're talking about. This is a review, a, a diagram out of a review which summarizes a variety of microbiome studies, and, and the different colors obviously represent different taxa uh, of, of bacteria, different classes of bacteria, families of bacteria. And we have chickens on the left, pigs in the middle, and cattle on the right. And we have different uh, levels of the gut from uh, the, the uh, uh, oral portion to the, to the anal portion, okay? And what you can see is that within a species, we have a dramatic change, dramatic differences in the microbiome, depending on the anatomic site, and that those microbiomes are different amongst the different species of animals. Uh, not too surprising, probably, right? But we can't talk about... You know, we probably should be very careful about saying what we find in one species at one type of sample and then extrapolating that again, over-extrapolating, over-interpreting the results. If we look at cattle and look a little more closely at, uh, at different levels and we compare uh, the digesta, the microbiome of the digest digesta, as well as the, to the microbiome of the mucosa, right? First of all, so these, these uh, diagrams on the right, the red and the green, uh, the green are the digesta microbiota, and the, and the red are the mucosal microbiota uh, at different levels. And you, and you can see that there are, there's differences, right, between, even in the same compartment, between the luminal microbiome as opposed to the mucosal microbiome, just as we find in people as well. So all this to point out that there's increased complexity even over what we're trying to look at when we just look at fecal samples or whatever. We have to be very careful or, or samples of, of different compartments. Now... Focusing in on disease a little bit and maybe what changes the microbiome and what effect does that have on the resistome. Um, this is some work from uh, the Lethbridge uh, Research Group, uh, Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada. Um, some really nice work where they're looking at the oropharyngeal uh, microbiota of cattle as they, as they enter feedlots. Now, this is a really critical time period with regard to disease and antimicrobial drug use because that's in beef cattle lifespan, that's when they are most likely to be treated for disease with antibiotics. So if we can control disease and understand what's going on there, let's have a dramatic impact on the uses that we have in those animals. And so what you can see here, uh, the dots are different samples. Uh, this is uh, NMDS plot, so similar to a principal components or PicoA plot. Um, and, and the red are samples that are taking at about seven months of age when the cattle are weaned. Uh, 
in a very short period of time, then they will transition to a feedlot. So it might be a few days, it might be a few weeks. And the blue represents that arrival at the feedlot and the green represents 40 days uh, after arrival at the feedlot. And it's pretty clear to see, right, you get this transition in the microbiome over the, over the time period that we've got. Um, at the same time, if we look more intensively at this post-arrival period, um, you can see, so here the green here are immediately after arrival, blue are two days, red are seven days, yellow are 14 days. So really short periods of time, we get dramatic shifts in the microbiome of the respiratory tract. Now, this has not very many animals, but, but I find it very interesting because what they've done is they've looked at animals that uh, sampled them longitudinally, and then they sampled them arrival, and then uh, uh, 60 days after they'd been in the feedlot. And then they were able to find out which, one, which animals were, treat, were sick and treated with antimicrobials and which were not. So the, the orange and the green are treated cattle here, and the blue and the red are non-treated cattle. What it looks like to me here, and needs to be further proven out, is that there are differences between the cattle that get sick and those that stay healthy, even at day zero, right? So there is a dysbiosis, or there's maybe not a, there is an evidence that there's a difference in the microbiome of these cattle that become sick even before they are clinically ill, all right? When we look at the uh, microbiome through the, uh, and the resistome through the, uh, through the rest of the feeding period, um, so we've got, uh, uh, this is a study that we performed where we looked at cattle at the arrival, uh, at exit, so something like 280 days later, and then as they transitioned through the harvesting process, so on the truck, in the larage, okay, at the harvest facility, and then sampled product after the animals had been harvested, what we find in our samples is that there's an incredible separation of the microbiome based on the type of sample that we collect. So there's different microbiota, there's different microbiomes in these different samples. That's perhaps, again, not too surprising, okay? Um, that's what this block A is showing. But we also see that there's a difference in the resistome as well that's correlated with this difference in the microbiome. So the, the blue and the, these, these clusters that overlap here, those are samples that are taken within a day of each other from fecal samples, so that's not too surprising. Those are the samples uh, right before they went to the harvest facility and then at the harvest facility. And these, the pink here is the sample uh, at, a, uh, at the arrival, so 280 days previously, and we, we see this separation in the resistome, right? So there's a difference in the resistome over time. And we find that in feces, we find that in soil, and we find that in water. Um, this is a procrustis analysis, which looks at the correlation in differences between microbiome and resistome, right? And what it says here, because the axes are not shifted, it says that there is a correlation between differences, between different samples. The, the microbiome correlates with the resistome, right? So chain, differences that we see in the resistome are correlated with differences that we see in the microbiome, okay? which is pretty cool, right? It means that it suggests that the microbiome is impacting what we see in the resistome as much as anything. If we look at this plot here, which shows the log fold change in abundance from over that 280 day period across these different classes of antimicrobial genes, that change, that, that change in the resistome, right, that's correlated to change in the microbiome is actually associated with a decreased abundance and a decreased diversity of resistance genes. And we didn't do anything. We just managed those cattle the way we normally do. Right? So bars that point to the left, they are, the, genes were more, the gene classes were more abundant at the time the cattle were placed, and that is true for all of the fecal samples. And those that point to the right, they're more abundant at the 200 days late, 280 days later when we shipped, and that's only true for tetracycline in water and uh, amino or sorry, macrolides uh, uh, in, the, in the soil. When we look across all of these sampling time points, another thing to point out, so we see this decrease in abundance of resistance genes at the different time points, but I want you to notice that in our samples that we took in the, in the meat, we found no resistance genes. Okay, now there are problems, there are complications associated with how well we're able to find that in background DNA, but the point being that our food safety systems, which decrease the prevalence or pr the, the likelihood of identifying pathogens, decrease the likelihood of identifying other kinds of bacteria, decrease the likelihood of encountering antimicrobial resistance genes. So all of this is working in favor of the consumer. So our, our, our traditional, our, our conventional approach to raising cattle is, is, is helping us here. 
Now, there are other age-associated differences that in the microbiome and the resistome that I won't get into, but one, for example, as you go from a calf, a dairy calf to a dairy cow, we see shifts in the microbiome that are dramatic, and we see shifts in the resistome that are dramatic, the same type of thing. So it's not just beef cattle. Now, what about those specific applications of antimicrobial drugs? Well, here's one study just to, just to look at this. And so the, in this study, we took uh, beef cattle that were coming out of a common background, um, and we split them. And we had cattle that were treated, all of the cattle were treated with a therapeutic dose of telathromycin, which is an advanced spectrum macrolide, okay, in the class of erythromycin and other macrolides. Um, and the other cattle were not treated. And we took fecal samples per rectum on arrival at the time that that was taken, and then 11 days later. And here are the results summarized, okay. So we've got the microbiome in this uh, NMDS plot on the left, and the resistome portion of, the, of, of those genes uh, and on the right. The, uh, the, ar the arrival samples uh, uh, are red and black, and the day 11 samples are blue and green here with treatment and control. You can see that. And we get overlap at the timing of the sample, right, not with treatment. We get overlap with when the samples were collected and not with treatment. And that shifts, so we see a shift in the microbiome from arrival just to 11 days in the feces here. And we see the same thing in the resistome, right? So it suggests that the time period, right, that that shift in the microbiome is more impactful on the, on the resistome changes than is the actual treatment that we've given. And we've given therapeutic doses to all of those cattle, right? Um, here's a study where that's uh, in press right now where we, we looked at sequel samples uh, collected at the time of harvest, so um, uh, prior to evisceration or just post-evisceration uh, in the plant. These are beef cattle. They, some of the cattle that came out of uh, raised without antibiotic systems or organic or natural type systems and those that came out of conventional rearing systems. And these are, uh, this is abundance information for all, back, for all types of bacterial genes and different types. And the point being, if you look at the red and the green, which are natural and conventional here, um, you see that there's complete overlap in those samples. So there's no difference in, those, in the sequel flora in terms of the abundance of these resistance genes uh, when we look across all of these things. So not as much of an impact as we would like to think. Now, at the same time, when we do that same study and look at individual production facilities, so this is a study that we did looking in feedlots and then, then looking in dairies, and you can see that in ger and then these are different types of samples, so soil, wastewater uh, on the facility, uh, fecal samples taken late in the production system and uh, uh, production period and early in the production period. And you can see that in the conventional, those that conventional system, those that use antibiotics compared to the natural or the raised without antibiotic, there's a bit of a difference in the abundance of the hits to that. And if we look in these organic and, uh, organic and conventional dairies, we see the same type of thing here. Okay, but I would question, based on the work that we've uh, accumulated so far, that maybe these are as much differences uh, between operations, between facilities, just like you would see differences between individual people when we start talking about the microbiome, right? So uh, it's very much, in my opinion, jury out on, on the impacts of these things. Um, there, there are studies that have shown that, you know, you can impact the microbiome. Cephalosporins are very impactful in animals, just as they are in people, uh, affecting fecal flora and changes in shedding. Um, but these are transient changes. So there is acute plasticity, but really amazing resilience, okay, and coming back to sort of a core look at what those, what those look like. And that's been looked and found in, in the milk microbiome, uh, young broilers, as well as growing swine as well. Now, Cautionary notes, okay, so as much as I thought we were overgeneralizing with relation to the individual isolate information, we have to be extraordinarily careful in overgeneralizing uh, over from these research. I think there's a lot of things that we have to learn about the methods that we're using and how we look at these to find the associations. I don't believe that the antimicrobial drugs exposures are all equal, right? There's probably classes and types of antimicrobial drugs that have a much greater impact on microbiome and potentially resist them than do other drugs, right? And we're extremely shallow in this research, and it tends to be the case in all of our animal-related research, particularly when we compare it to research in humans. Um, we, 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 the, mon the funding may not be there, or we may be more tolerant of, of doing one study and not repeating it, and we need to, we need to get away from that. So 
Um, I thank you very much for that flyby uh, uh, of some conversation about antimicrobial exposures in the, meta, in the metagenome and the microbiome. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for a, a question or two. Oh, thank you very much, very informative. Uh, in a few slides back there was a chart that showed a comparison between conventional and natural, I think it might have been a feedlot side, and then on the dairy side, conventional and organic. Was that intentional? Um, it's a good question, and it has to do with the terminologies around the production styles. Organic is a, is a label that we apply very carefully, and we only use it when we're talking about USDA uh, certified organic production, right, which, has, which is much more stringent. It's very hard to have that uh, in, a, in a beef production setting and that's in a feedlot type. And so there are other labels that are applied. Natural is one label. It has no regulatory uh, definition. I, it, it has to do with yeah. the, the product's definition, right? So well, it has to do with the marketing. Correct, of correct. But so the, 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 so it's not organic in the sense that if it, on the dairy, the, the, the produce, or sorry, the produce, the forage uh, has to be organic, all the feed has to be organically produced. Uh, they can't use anthelmintics, chemical, quote unquote, uh, right. anthelmintics, those kinds of things. That's very hard to do, and, and so they, they label them in different, raised without antibiotic labels. Yeah. Well, there was almost like a two to one difference in the uh, conventional organic and much less difference in the conventional natural, and natural is really a meaningless term. Correct. So Correct. And again, yeah. I would suggest that those were, so that those were only four operations that we did those. We, we did a lot of work. I mean, it was a very, very expensive study, hundreds of samples, but it was only four production systems, and I worry that um, while we can look deeply into individual production systems, I worry that we've got uh, individual, uh, between farm microbiome differences that are impacting this as much as oh, sure. the actual impact of no antibiotic use. Sure. Thank you. Quick question. Um, much of the, your, your marker here is focused on the resistance genes themselves, but there's, there's an indirect response to selection um, with these antimicrobials in that it probably is also increasing the abundance of uh, uh, mobile elements in these metagenomes as well. Have you got a way that you can measure that? And then secondarily, can you also measure the amount of either recombination or the amount of genomic diversity that might be generated from this? Uh, really good question, and, and yeah, the aspect of mobile elements then is, a, is another complexity, um, just as translation is. Um, and, and so looking at translation events would be one way to look at some of those things, right? What's, you know, uh, a conjugation or whichever. Um, uh, we've thought about doing some work like uh, looking at plasmids specifically, trying to dissect the resistome into a virome, uh, all the ohm terms, sorry, right? So we look at the phage, phage related resistance elements and we, we do plasmid specific extractions and look at those too, but we haven't gotten there on that. But it's a great question, right? To me, that's a scarier outcome is that you're accelerating evolution. Possibly, it may, yeah. It may be a, a worse outcome than the resistance itself is. Yeah, possibly. And there is some in vitro work, uh, you know, bench work suggesting that um, uh, uh, phage, exp you know, uh, phage uh, transcription goes up with antimicrobial exposure and that you get increased conjugation events. That really hasn't been carried out into the animal, you know, into these types of production systems. We need to do that work for the reasons that you're mentioning. 